Hello, Journey in the Bible family. Where's your Bibles? I have mine right here and we are ready to dive deep into God's word. This is ACAD. What is ACAD, you ask? Well, it is in fact a chapter a day. And we have decided to dive deep into God's word every single day because truth of the matter is we need God's word every single day. And man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God every single day. Give us this day our daily bread, we ask. That's for physical bread, but also for spiritual. And so today I have something for us that we can feast on in God's word. And today we are in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. We only have 29 verses. Let's see if we can cover them in less than 10 minutes. That would be a miracle. But you see, it's not about perusing through these verses that gives us the strength that we need. It's about believing the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so if you're excited about this, get your Bibles, bring them, open them, subscribe, follow the journey, join the journey, invite friends so that we can study together these amazing and precious truths. Hebrews chapter 12, before we dive deep into God's word, let us seek his presence. Father God, bless your word as you have already. I pray, Father, that your word would not return to you void, but that it would do what you have purposed it to do. You know, Father, why this specific chapter, you know what it was written to do and to inspire in us. I pray, Father, that even that might be realized today to those who are listening, watching, and to myself as well. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which that so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us a lot can be said about this verse this verse in fact the book of hebrews is slowly becoming my favorite chapter and this particular verse slowly becoming my favorite verse because it sums up everything. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the whole of faith as it is commonly known. At least people who were faithful, people who had faith, figures of faith, people who were strong, people who obeyed God. We are told about Abel, Abraham, and Moses, and all these great giants of faith. And the reason why we are given that picture in chapter 11 is so that we might have hope. As it were, the scriptures were written a full time so that we, through patience, might have hope. As we study God's word, that we might have hope. If Abel was able, then I am also able by God's grace because we share the same faith in the same God. And so this is what Hebrews 11 inspires for us. You see these great men of faith, they were able. Under varied circumstances, they were able to still be faithful. They were tempted and tried, but they were still able because they had faith. Faith is what we need. And Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, seeing all these people, these great cloud of witnesses, they are witnesses, they're, they're witnesses because they have experienced the power of God. They know what they are talking about. When Moses writes, he knows what he's talking about. When Paul writes, he knows what he's talking about. And so if you are discouraged, you feel like giving up the faith. Well, look no further than Hebrews 11. All the men and women of faith, under varied circumstances, under pressure, trials, persecution, even they did not give up because they knew something about faith. They knew that it's worth it. They are witnesses of the gospel and the goodness of God. And so when we look at them, these cloud of witnesses, these great characters of the Bible, we are encouraged to lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. They also did lay aside every weight and sin. And we can too Lay aside every weight and sin, anything that disrupts your communion with God, anything that disconnects you from heaven, you have to lay that aside. 
One single sin cherished is enough to ruin your entire life and prevent you from getting eternal life, the promise of God. The scriptures tell us, let he that calleth the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. You cannot be a Christian and still participate willingly in sin. So we are called to repent and be converted so that our, 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 our sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. I hope the Spirit is speaking to you as you consider th this specific verse as it applies to your life. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we have looked unto the witnesses, but Paul says it's not enough to gain strength from the Bible characters that we read about. When, we, when you read the story of Moses, it is quite encouraging, right? When you read the story of, of Stephen, Stephen, it was quite encouraging, right? When you read about these great men, when you read Samson, it is encouraging that even though he was not always right, that God was merciful to him. You get strength from the life of Joseph and Daniel and all the others that were with him. But Paul says, the source of the true strength is not just the cloud of witnesses, but looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we have faith, but that faith is not our own. Jesus is the author and finisher, the alpha and the omega of our faith. And so he says in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, ye can do nothing. That's why we have to look unto Jesus. We look unto him because he is our source. He is our support system. The moment we stop looking unto Jesus, we drown. Just like the story of Peter, when he stopped, looking unto Jesus, he drowned. Are you looking unto Jesus? What does it mean to look unto Jesus? Are you focused on Christ? Are you connected to Christ? Well, if you are not, this verse is calling you to do that, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him. This is what we're supposed to look and consider about Christ that there was a joy set before him. He endured the cross because of that joy. He was looking at the joy that was set before him. He despised the shame. And now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God because he endured, because he continued to have faith in God. And so when life confuses you and you feel like, oh man, I don't even know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't think I can fully follow God. Look unto Jesus. Look at his life. Because he is our perfect example. The song says, look unto Jesus. Sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me. We look unto Jesus because he is our example. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us that he was at all points tempted, yet without sin. And so when we look unto him, it's not a stare. It is a prayer. We are looking unto him for strength. We are looking unto him for direction. We are looking unto him for comfort. We are looking unto him for spiritual strength. That's why we look unto him. Not to copy his life, but to receive the enabling to live his life. To allow him to live through us. The other song says, Leave out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. And that's the experience that this chapter is calling us to. 15 minutes already, but let's keep going. Diving deep into God's word. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The reason why, friends, we have to look unto Jesus and consider Jesus is because Jesus went through lots of things that we are supposed to go through. And when we consider him, 
we'll find out very soon that there's nothing that he has not been through that we are going through. And as a result, we are confident that he is able to succor, as the word says, those that are tempted, to support those that are tempted, which is you and me. He endured the contradiction of sinners. As you can see in the picture, he was always arguing with the Pharisees and even other sinners around him. Sinners who thought they were perfect. You know, the reason why we have to consider this is because we have to make sure that we do exactly what Christ did, lest we are wearied and faint in our minds. It's possible to faint, to just be tired of right doing. And so the scriptures also remind us, do not be weary of well-doing, for in due season you shall receive a reward. But friends, I want to admit it's possible to become weary. Spiritual fatigue, I call it. And if we stop looking unto Jesus, if we stop considering Jesus, meditating on his life and death and resurrection every single day, we will get wearied and faint in our minds. Hebrews continues to tell us, 12 verse 4, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So context, he's writing to the Hebrews at this time, the children of Israel. They're going through some tough times, but not really tough yet. It hasn't been tough yet. This is before the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's telling them, you know what? You guys shouldn't even worry about this because you have not yet resisted unto blood. He's telling them that it could be worse. Let me ask you something. What are you going through right now? Do you feel like, oh, this is so bad? Well, the scripture says it could be worse. Did you know that the peace, the security we have right now is only a gift from God? And if it wasn't for God, if it wasn't for the four angels that are holding the winds of heaven, as we are told in the books of Re in the book of Revelation, things will be worse. So we ought to be thankful, even for the temptations we have, the trials we have, because it could be worse. Did you know that according to the scriptures, God himself weighs every temptation. He weighs every trial before he allows you to go through it. Well, go no further than 1 Corinthians 13, 10, 13, I believe, or 13, 10, which tells us that there's, there's no temptation that has taken any man but that it is common to everyone and that God always provides a way of escape and he does not allow you to go through what you cannot bear. So whatever you're going through, God knows you can bear it. Believe that you can bear it and you will bear it. Five, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked. This is taken straight from the book of Proverbs chapter 3, where we are told not to despise chastening of the Lord, but to accept rebu rebuke and correction. And it is there in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, for context if you want to go there, that we are told that those that the Lord loves, he rebukes and it is in that same chapter where we find the amazing verse that is memorized by many which says trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths why is this important because there are times when you could you cannot in fact all the times you should not trust yourself because there will be a time where the way things appear is not the way things are, really. There'll be a time when the things that are going on in your life will communicate a very different message from the truth. So you cannot trust what you see. You cannot trust what you feel. That's why you have, you cannot, and you should not lean to your own understanding. Instead, as the song says, lean on the everlasting arms. Lean on Jesus. Whenever you make a decision and you're confused about it, or even when you're not confused about it, always lean on the side 
of Jesus. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Again, from Proverbs chapter 3. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? This is very straightforward, right? If you have a child as a father, if you do not correct your child, you cannot really confidently say that that is your child that you are raising. It must be that someone else or something else is raising that child. But if you truly love your child, you correct them and you test them to see how they are growing and going and you you want the best for them. Same thing applies with God. But if we be without chastisement, Whereof are we partakers? Whereof all are partakers? Then we are bastards and not sons. Very clear, right? And straightforward. If we do not partake in the chastisement, the correction of God, then we cannot be of God. Because for us to be of God, we have to go through a specific test and training so that we can fully reflect God. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? If we obey our parents, shall we not obey God, who is greater than our parents? Verse 10. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And this is the crux of the message today. All the tests, all the trials, all the pressure, all the suffering, all the pain we go through, every single circumstance is calculated so that we may be partakers of God's holiness. This world The experiences we have every day is our school. It's our learning. The school of Christ. We learn to be like God. And these experiences, they shape us and they mold us to be like God. This perspective is really important and brings peace for those who are going through trials, which is everyone. This is where we have our 60 seconds plus with God And it is found today in uh, Hebrews 12, verse 11. There it says, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. When you're going through trials, when you're going through chastening and correction, even when someone corrects you, it doesn't really feel great in the moment, but later it yields righteousness, peaceable fruit of righteousness unto those that are exercised thereby. This is why we have to love correction. This is why the book of Proverbs 3 told us not to be weary of the chastening of the Lord, of God's instruction and correction. And so it it is the psalmist that says, correct me. Right, But not in thine anger, lest I be brought to nothing. So we have to love this correction. We have to love the chastisement of God because when he chastises us, when he corrects us and shapes us and molds us through the experiences of life, the end is better than the beginning. I hope that encourages you. For those who love to follow 60 seconds plus with God, I hope that's a blessing for you. Please share, like, and comment. And in fact, if you're here on this channel, do so. Like, comment, subscribe. What are your thoughts so far? What do you think about this verse? Moving on, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. This is synonymous to James chapter 2, I believe, in fact, chapter 1, where we are told to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptation. And trials, when we are tried, when we are tempted, when we are under pressure, it's not time to complain and murmur. It's time to rejoice, to lift up our hands 
and, our, and, and strengthen our feeble knees, encourage ourselves in the Lord. As the scripture says, God himself saying to Joshua, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid and make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. You know yourself. You know your path, your walk with God. It cannot be lame. It cannot be unfruitful. For Christ says in John 15 that it is the desire of God the Father that we bear much fruit, for thereby he is glorified. And every branch that does not bring fruit is cut out and removed. It is not God's will that we might we might be cut out and removed. It is not God's will that we might perish but have everlasting life. God is in the process, in the business of reconciliation. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews is about reconciliation, bringing us back to God. Whereas we had gone astray, God brings us back to himself. Moving on, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. But how do we get this holiness? Well, this holiness comes through the trials, through the chastisement of God. And so we find Jesus chastising, Jesus correcting, and Jesus educating at all times his people, training them, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up and thereby many be defiled. Diligently, looking unto Jesus. Looking how? Looking diligently. Diligence is very important. Effort is required in this race, in this Christian walk. For we were told in the previous chapter that faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know that part. But it also says in verse 6, For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must first believe that he is, number one, and that he is a rewarder of those that faith diligently seek him. Number two, diligence. How do we seek God? Diligently. Seek the Lord, we are told, while he may yet be found. Those that seek me early shall find me. But we have to look diligently, lest we fail of the grace of God. Friends, it is very possible to fail of the grace of God. In fact, many of us have turned God's grace into lasciviousness as a license to sin. That's how we fail of God's grace. So we have to make sure there's no root of bitterness springing up that might trouble us. Yes, bitterness, that's all it could take to ruin and to fail or to make the grace of God fail. Bitterness in the heart. Do you have bitterness in your heart? Diligently make sure that it is uprooted and removed. 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Just one morsel of meat and he sold his birthright. This is not a good example of having appetite as our God, having the belly as our God, as the scripture says, putting our present needs and wants, needs in fact, before God and thereby being a fornicator. You ask, how was Esau a fornicator? You could say literally, but really he was a fornicator in that he worshipped, he idolized things, he worshipped things other than God. He put other gods before God, thereby breaking the first commandment and by implication the seventh. Because we are all married to God. We are his bride. Esau, for one muscle of meat, sold his birthright. And watch what happens next. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Sounds like what Jesus says in Matthew 8. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If 
we refuse to accept the birthright. If we let go of the birthright, which we have in Christ Jesus, and to those that believed on him, he gave power to become the sons and daughters of God. But if we let go of that faith because of some other present preoccupations, then we lose our birthright. And as a result, we will be rejected and we will have no place for repentance. And we will seek repentance with tears, but we won't find it. Because there will be no time anymore for repentance. Probation will have closed at that time. What are your thoughts so far? What are you gaining from this short but long chapter? Verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Speaking of Mount Sinai, this is not where we are. We are past Old Testament uh, rituals and ceremonies. This is the real stuff that we're going into. He says, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken unto them. Even Moses, we are told. The sight was so terrible. The mount was quaking. Fire was burning. Sight was so terrible that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Here's a little quiz for you. Can you find that verse for us and comment it in the comment section? So the book of Hebrews, really, what it's doing, it's showing us that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the shadows and types, that he is the real deal, the real thing. Which is why we have to look unto Jesus, because he is the author and finisher. And so now we are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. It's now real. Hebrews talks about the Old Testament sanctuary services and furnitures and articles that were really so great. But then he says, of all the things we have spoken, this is the sum. We have an high priest. A minister of the true tabernacle. And he is in heaven right now. Jesus right now in the most holy place. We look unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. The one who died for our sins. The one who resurrected, giving us power and victory over sin. And the one who soon will return and give us final victory from this world. To the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the Judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Christ told the disciples to rejoice not that they have cast out devils, but because their names are written in the book of heaven. Our names are written if we are faithful to Christ. In fact, he says in Revelation, the third chapter, that if we overcome, he will confess our names before the Father and the holy angels. This great company of angels we just read about, he will confess our names before them. But if we deny him, he will also deny us before his Father and his holy angels. And to Jesus, the real deal, the main focus of our, of our study, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling, the blood representing his life and his, his sacrifice that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel believed in Jesus. He believed in the sacrifice of Christ. See that you refuse not him that speaks. I've come to a realization and an observation that the book of Hebrews is about the God who speaks. For we are told in chapter 1 that God who at sundry times and in diverse manners 
Speak. Speak. Speak through the prophets. Has now spoken by his son. By his son. But he is speaking. The God who speaks. God is speaking right now to you through this chapter. But the question is, are you listening? Are you accepting the movement of the Holy Spirit within your heart? The thing is, if they escape not, who refused to hear him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape. If we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, same book of Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? There's no escape because God speaks. He speaks expressly, clearly. And what is he speaking? What is he saying? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in times past. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shall not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Will you be able to stand when God speaks? In the book of Revelation, Christ is represented as having in his mouth, the sword coming out. The word of God is powerful, remember, quicker than any two-edged sword. It divides even to the joints and marrows. It knows the intents of the heart. All things are naked before him. His words. Will you be able to stand when they are spoken? When he gives his judgments, will you be able to stand and remain? Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Grace. Whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We need grace. And God's grace is sufficient for you and me. It doesn't matter what we are going through. It doesn't matter where our walk with God is. God's grace is sufficient for you and me. And so I pray and plead with you that you would take hold of God's grace and don't live your life without his grace because it's only his grace that strengthens you. His graces, they are they that modify and changes you. So pray and ask for God's grace every single day. Have the grace because we have received a kingdom that cannot be moved. A kingdom of righteousness. The kingdom we are told to seek first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And now in closing. In closing. God is a consuming fire. Our God is is a consuming fire. Interesting verse. God is a consuming fire. Taken from the Old Testament, of course, God consumes everything that is unlike him. He consumes everything that is wicked and sinful because he cannot coexist with sin. And so God is a consuming fire. He consumes and destroys the sin, which is why he wants us to be free from sin. Holiness is what God is calling you and me to. Be holy as I am holy, he says. That is his will. For this is the will of God. That you abstain fornication. What is fornication, you ask? Well, even the physical one. But what God is more interested in, what he is talking about, is friendship with the world. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
Have you not heard? Have you not read? Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For he that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But they that do God's will, they abide forever. And I pray and I call you to do God's will so that you may abide forever. Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I hope you were encouraged as we were going (laughs) verse by verse through this chapter. It took a little longer than I expected and anticipated, but such is God's word. And this was just a scratch on the surface. But I pray that God will speak to you through his word because I believe and I know that his word will do what it does. So thanks for listening. Thanks for for, for participating. And I hope that you will join me tomorrow as we dive deep into a chapter a day.